What is what what do you make of the structure of the job that they hired Michael to do the president of not just the Wizards but of monumental basketball and how many other folks in the NBA are doing similar type of jobs? Um, you know, I'm not sure that there are a lot of people who oversee both uh, an NBA and a WNBA team. I, I'm going to be honest with you on this. I think that, you know, <laughs> I don't know that there's going to be a lot for Mike Winger to oversee with the with the Mystics. I mean, Mike Tebow sure. is one of the all-time best people in the history of that sport, of that league in terms of knowing the game, knowing the league, knowing the players. Don't think he needs a whole lot of help from Michael Winger on that. So, and that yeah. team is pretty pretty uh, ready made to compete for a championship this year. So, um, you know, while technically yes, he will have to get budgets approved and stuff like that. I, I can't imagine that's going to be something that's going to cause a lot of angst um, between the two of them and the rest of the Mystics organization. So, it's you know, it's a title. I think you you know. You may have to give the guy a title to get him out of what was a very well-paying job with the Clippers and get him out from under Steve Ballmer, who obviously has quite a bit of resources. So um, you may have had to give him things that the Clippers couldn't offer, and obviously the Clippers don't have a WNBA team under their umbrella. Um, the Sparks are under the Lakers' umbrella. So, uh, you know, that I think that's just kind of a – honorific um i think it's more about him being in charge of the wizards yeah definitely and as i said earlier in the show if the mystics win the next three WNBA titles and the wizards are still winning 38 games michael winger is not going to have a job anymore um that's just that's just mm-hmm. how how this is um all due respect to to what the tebows are doing uh with the mystics but that's kind of the point is like they've got that thing under control it's just uh, the, the Wizards just never do anything like everybody else, and I thought that was that was interesting. As for the guy they hired, though, it seems like he is a fantastic hire from everything I've heard so far. What do you know about Michael Winger and kind of what his role was in L.A. working with Lawrence Frank? Well, the first thing is that he is a very smart guy by all accounts. Um, really, really creative in terms of um, putting together potential deals and negotiating contracts and things like that. Um, But, you know, his background is not as a kind of basketball guy as I think most people would, you know, kind of think of that title. You know, he's not a guy that's going to be doing a ton of scouting. You know, he looks at tape and things like that. So he doesn't – it's not like he has no knowledge about players and things like that. But but his strength is not in terms of scouting or things like that that GMs tend to be associated with. Uh, he, he is a an analytics guy. He is a lawyer, you know, um, with a lot of basketball knowledge. But but that's his background. He's a big picture guy in terms of putting together organizational structure where everything kind of works together fairly harmoniously. Um, the Clippers again are owned by Steve Ballmer. That is a big big job to be working to trying to make Steve Ballmer's companies successful and make making him happy. Uh, and I think Michael Winger did a good job with that, along with Lawrence Frank, of putting together a pretty good Clippers team. They have won a championship, and they were built to win a championship, but I think fairness dictates that you explain that, you know, Kawhi Leonard's in a, it, unavailability has been a big part of that. Paul George's unavailability has been a big part of why they haven't broken through. Um, their two superstar players have been injured a lot the last four years. Uh, you can't count on that, um, but everything else has run pretty well with the Clippers, and I think their hope is that you know he can bring some of that structural competence to the Wizards while also working well with a basketball guy the way he worked with Lawrence Frank, who is the basketball kind of guy in the Clippers front office um, at the senior level, and they put a pretty good team around Paul George and, and Kawhi Leonard. So they're hoping that when Winger makes the hire here, he can have a similar kind of synergy with whoever he brings in to do the scouting, you know, basketball kind of evaluation uh, piece of it. And they can put a pretty good team together here. 
David Aldridge, senior columnist from The Athletic with us, of course, Basketball Hall of Famer here on the Team 980. And yeah, David, like you said, like Lawrence Frank is a basketball guy. For those that don't know, former NBA coach and a pretty darn good one who makes the move into the front office. So it would make sense that now Winger is going to look for a general manager that is is something like that in terms of being a basketball guy, not necessarily a, a former coach, but who knows. What, where does that leave the list of candidates if you were to try to make an early list of the either specific names if you've heard anything or the, the profile of who might be up for that job? And then how do they kind of split the power dynamics and the responsibilities between the two of them? Uh, look, I think you're certainly going to be looking at people that are in front offices right now. Maybe they don't have the title of general manager, but they certainly are uh, uh, involved in that space. You know, I'll just give you a name of a type of a guy I would, I would like to think he would look at. A guy like Jeff Peterson, who's a local guy and, of course, went to the most successful high school in the history of the United States, the Massachusetts Catholic High School, um, <laughs> and is the assistant GM of the Nets right now. Um, and, you know, is a very, very you know, an up-and-coming, very highly thought-of young executive in the NBA that, you know, certainly has had successes and failures like everything else, and, and the, the Nets have been <laughs> an interesting group, <laughs> to say the least, the last few years. Uh, but Jeff Peterson is a guy that's that's been in that world of acquisition of superstar level players, um, knows what that is like as an organization, the things that you have to do to, to get make yourself appealing to superstars that want to play for you, um, but also has been part of a rebuild, you know, kind of rebuilding on the fly as they've had to do the last six months with the trades of Durant and with Kyrie and kind of rebuilding the thing and trying to rebuild on the fly. And so he's got different experiences and skill sets. That's just one name. You know, Mark Eversley is a very smart guy as well as currently uh, in Chicago um, is is working with Arturis Kanishevis, who's the boss there. And Mark is the GM and they've had a good relationship there. And the, the bulls, frankly, are kind of in a, at a crossroads like the Wizards are with regard to their talent. But, you know, there, there are guys out there who could certainly step in and do that work along with Michael Winger. I don't know who Michael knows, so I don't, there's not like an obvious uh, connection, but certainly he works uh, at Oklahoma City for several years before he went to the Clippers. He's been with the Clippers for many years, certainly will have a knowledge about some of the young executives that are in that building as well. So um, we'll find, I think they're going to get this done fairly quickly. They have to, because the draft's coming up in in about less than a month now. So they have to get going. No doubt. What about some of the folks here? Um, It was such an interesting front office, because I do know, like there's some pretty young, smart people that have been working in the Wizards front office, a lot of whom disagreed with a lot of the things that happened, the major decisions, let's call them, of what happened uh, that perhaps were, or in some cases definitely were ownership driven. Um, So is there a possibility that there are some of the folks in house that could stay or get elevated? Or are we looking at a complete overhaul of this front office once the new person comes in? And, you know, what would you make of, of either direction? I mean, I, you know, obviously we don't know what Michael Winger is going to do. He hasn't gotten on the ground yet. So I don't know if he's going to say, I got to clean house and start over. Again, I kind of doubt given the, the hour, you know, we're, we're less than a month before a fairly important draft for this, for this basketball team. So I can't imagine that you're going to come in and fire everybody that's been working on the draft for the Washington Wizards for the last nine months, you know, plus getting ready and putting things out. I think you're just going to come in and get through this draft as quickly as you can um, and then maybe spend the next year assessing the various people in the front office and the organization. The Wizards obviously kind of um, put some resources into analytics, more, more into analytics uh, in the last few years. Um, you know, we know that Brett Greenberg is there and, you know, they've hired some other people at, in, at fairly large amounts of uh, money to, to kind of bolster their analytics a little bit. Um, so they, they've got people in place to do that. Um, I would imagine there would be some synergy there, but, you know, everybody has to work with people that they feel comfortable with or that they know or they feel good about. And so, um, 
the Wizards have very, very smart people at that in that space. Are they going to be part of a new regime, or are they going to be replaced? I, you know, I just I can't say. But you know, Kathy Evans is pretty smart. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> Kathy Evans is pretty smart. She's she, she's pretty good at this at at number crunching. So um, I would be surprised if they couldn't find a way for that to work together. Right. And, and that's just, I think, the point to be made, right, is that just because this front office has done some incredibly mind-numbing things over the last couple of years doesn't mean that they they all did it holding hands, hunky-dory, happy about it. There's There are voices of dissent. I would say they were probably mm-hmm. typically pretty good about keeping that relatively in-house. But if you know the right people and who to talk to, there's certainly some folks over there that uh, just as head, or did just as much head-scratching as the rest of us around certain decisions that have been made over the last couple of years. Um, as for the decisions that will be made moving forward, the, the biggest one is obviously Beal. What do you think those conversations are like, and what do you think ultimately the the likelihood is that he's on the roster when they open training camp? Well, again, Craig, these are these are things that, that I just – it's hard for me to answer right now because I just don't – haven't had a chance to talk to Michael Winger about what, what he thinks, you know, what his philosophy is. Is it going to be – um, you know, sometimes a new person comes in and doesn't do anything the first year because they just want to see what they've got, or, you know, and what's what's good and what's not good. Um, I, you know, I am guessing that certainly they will start to make moves toward um, getting their roster more in line financially with a team of their caliber. It doesn't make sense for them to be – and over the cap, you know, they're not paying the tax right now, but they're 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 over the cap, and they're not near good enough to be over the cap, you know. So I, I would certainly think they will start to make some of those decisions. Does that mean they don't re-sign Porzingis? They don't re-sign Kuzma, or they sign and trade him? Um, it could. The Beal situation is its own thing because Brad has a no trade clause, so. It really doesn't matter what the Wizards want to do until Bradley Beal signs off on it. You know, now, now I would imagine when Winger comes in, he's going to have some sort of options, plans, whatever you want to call it, that he can present to Bradley Beal in terms of, hey, look, here's some things worth I'm thinking about doing in terms of if you want to waive your no trade, here's here's three or four places I think we could make a deal if you want to do that. Um Conversely, if Bill says, "Hey, I love it here. I don't want to leave here," then you're gonna. It's going to be more difficult because you're just not going to have the cap space that you would want. Um, and I think you have to have that honest conversation with him. Like, you know, honestly, if you stay here, chances are we're not going to win. Uh, we, we're not going to be a very competitive. You know, we're not going to be competitive enough at the top of the NBA. Um, so you have to weigh that. And Brad's got. You know, he's got the hammer in this situation. He he decides how long he's going to be here. But if Brad says, hey, you know, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to go through a rebuild. I don't want to spend another three years of you tearing it down around me and then building it back up. I'd like to be traded. Um, I think Michael Winger will have options available fairly quickly f- to make that happen. So I'd love to ask you about those options because it's been, become my favorite question to ask national NBA folks and folks like yourself who are mm-hmm. plugged in around the league. It's like, what is Brad's actual value on the market? I've had some people that say, like, they could trade him tomorrow, no problem. They'd, they'd probably get some stuff back for him. Maybe not a lot, but they'd get something of value back. I've had other people say, like, no, it's a negative value contract. They might have to attach a first-round pick to get rid of him. Where where do you think uh, the the Bradley Beal trade value meter is? Understanding the contract and also understanding that it's not a full market. You know, there's not there's not you know a full market of teams that he can go to. It's going to be a very limited number because of that no trade clause. Yeah, no question. It is definitely not easy to trade the fifty million dollar contract. I would say that that no contract's untradeable. However, I don't. I've never heard of you know. I've, been doing this a long time, Craig, and every five or six years, somebody says, there's no way they can trade that contract. And guess what? The contract gets traded. Mm -hmm. People get traded. Um, I I suspect, again, if if Bradley Beal wants to be traded, they will get him traded somewhere. Now, what will the return be? It may not be what you would think for somebody that's been an all-star multiple times, 
and is viewed as a pretty good player, like a top 30 type player. I think most people would, would say Brad's one of the, one of the 30 best or so players in the league. Now, is he top 15? No, he's not. Um, I don't think anybody would say he is. So, um, but I think they can get, they could get something for him. Uh, I, I would be surprised if they would be willing to attach a first round pick to a $50 million contract. I think they would say we're, you know, we're the ones that are, you know, taking on bad contracts in return. We're not going to also give you a first round pick to do it um, because they almost certainly would have to take multiple bad contracts back in order to make the numbers work. Um, So I don't know if that's something that we'll see, but uh, you know, so there, there could be trades. A lot will depend on how these playoffs shake out, you know, a lot will depend on maybe where, where does Kyrie Irving wind up, you know, because if he winds up in one place, that means he won't be in another place. And that team might be more inclined to make a move for somebody of Bradley's caliber. Um, but there's a lot of moving parts. The draft certainly is going to be part of that as well. Uh, so I think he's, look, if he wants to be traded, I think he'd be traded. I don't think that's going to be a problem. David Aldridge, senior columnist, at the athletic last thing, David, you actually just touched on this. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into it. But this final question is how have the playoffs influenced the market? Because, you know, I, I thought going into the playoffs, Philly and Miami were two really interesting ones to watch. And sure they were, but uh, they've gone in opposite ways of, I think how all of us thought they were, where Miami, a, a place that could have been a Bradley Beal trade target now, now might look at it and go, I don't know. We're an NBA finals team. We don't need Bradley Beal where Philly might go, man, we really need to switch something up. Uh, and obviously Joel and Brad are extremely tight, both Drew Hanlon guys, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, who knows what happens in Boston, uh, depending on what happens tonight. How, how have these playoffs kind of shifted uh, the trade market and what you think might happen kind of league-wide this summer, both specific and non-specific mm-hmm. to Brad? Well, look, certainly um, Philly is going to be kind of an up-in-the-air thing, you know, depending on what they do with Harden. Do they have a deal with Harden ready to go, and, you know, that they've negotiated already? Uh, if they do, that window closes. If they don't, the rumor, you know, a lot of people have speculated that Harden wants to go back to Houston, be with the, play with the Rockets for whatever reason, who knows why. Um, if he decides to leave, then that, then that certainly would make Philadelphia a possibility for a guy like Beal. You know, they would certainly be one to maximize Embiid's window of contention. He's right in the middle of his prime. I think we would all agree. Um, so Philly would certainly be a case, you know, obviously I think everybody who follows basketball knows that Jason Tatum and Brad are extremely tight, right? I mean, they are extremely close. Um, and so if the, if the Celtics go out before the finals, if they don't come back, um, and they get beat in the conference final, I think that's certainly a place you would, you could potentially look at as a team that might be looking to make an upgrade or do more, you know, move things around to, take another crack at it next year. Um, what does Milwaukee do? You know, the, they fired Mike Budenholzer. Clearly that's a, that's a team in some level of flux. You know, is it, is a, is it a tweak with a player or two change or is it a total rebuild? They've got a guy in Chris Middleton who is a, you know, well-regarded player, but Chris is getting up there in age and he's got an option for $40 million next year. If he opts in, that may change what they want to do. You know, so there, again, there are teams – that could use Bradley Beal. So it's not like there's no teams out there that could use him. They could use him at $50 million. Uh, if, they, if they think he can be a valuable second, maybe third option on a championship level team. I mean, he's not what we, th- what people in Washington think of Bradley Beal is not what people around the league think of Bradley Beal. You know, I'll just put it that way. Right. I think well, most people around the league think Bradley Beal is a pretty damn good player. And, you know, maybe he's not, he shouldn't be the best player on your team, but if he's your second or third best player, you're pretty good. So I think that the, the, we've seen it, Craig, in all of the coaching firings that we've seen and the players aren't even over yet. You know, we've seen Doc Rivers fired because you didn't, why? Because you didn't win. Monty Williams fired. Why? Because you didn't win. Bowden holds fired. Why? Because you didn't win. Nick Nurse fired. Why? Because you didn't win. And so that is, Certainly, part it's certainly the pressure to win is getting worse in this league. It's not getting better. So teams are going to be increasingly desperate to do things to build championship level teams. 
And in that, from that standpoint, I don't, again, that's why I don't think if, if there are teams, and it only takes one that thinks, hey, Bradley Beal could help us in a different role with different responsibilities in a different organization, he can get traded this summer. I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, David Aldridge, senior columnist at the Athletic Basketball Hall of Famer. Always appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much, and uh, have a great weekend. Okay, Craig, my pleasure, sir. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.